What is good everyone, I'm Forrest Walker and hello from Mintz Belarus. So this is not a video I planned on making, but people always wanna know some of the crazier stories that have happened to me on the road working on the project in different cities. And just a few days ago, I was arrested here at Mintz Belarus while out doing some photography work. It's actually the fifth country I've been arrested in during the whole project, photographing cities. And people always wanna know those stories, so I thought now that I'm making videos, why not share about it? It just happened. So before we get into it though, when I tell stories or when I write stories in the blog, I like to be exactly how it happened. I don't like to sensationalize, embellish, or exaggerate anything, just completely how it happened. It's probably almost to a fault because the best storytellers are the ones that exaggerate here and there, but I just want to tell it exactly how it happened. My description of everything, the police, how I was treated, I'm not going to exaggerate anything. I know people, uh, the locals that I mentioned this to about getting arrested, the first thing they always say is, did you get beat up? They expect something really bad happened. Obviously, I didn't get beat up. So I'm not going to make it sound worse than it is, but it wasn't good for there for a while. But even though I tell the stories exactly how they happen and people are always asking for more stories, I used to share them on the blog, but then I stopped. And I did that for kind of a reason. Uh, way back at the end of 2015, when I first started the project, was the first time I got arrested while working on it, and it was in Morocco. It was actually in Chef Shawan, Morocco, and I was arrested there. I'm gonna leave a link in the uh, description below, but I wrote about it after it happened, and it was early on in the project, early on in the blog, so I didn't have a ton of followers yet. So I got a few messages about it, but then I just forgot about it. Then fast forward like half a year, I'd say, all of a sudden I noticed on Google Analytics that I had a huge like viewership from Morocco all of a sudden, and then I started getting all these messages all from Moroccans. And most of the messages were extremely apologetic, asking me not to judge their country off this, like really extreme. And I didn't quite understand it because I didn't write it that extreme. When I wrote about it, I did it exactly like a timeline, like almost like one of those crime shows where it was by the time even. I did it exactly how it happened. I even kind of didn't tell a few different things that would have made it a little more, I don't know, um, polarizing. So I just kind of just went straight by the book, straight how it happened. So I didn't really understand why people were apologizing because I didn't say anything bad about Morocco. I didn't make it sound worse than it was. And then I started getting all these messages too where they were very hateful and calling me a liar and how dare I make up a story about Morocco and make them look bad and all this stuff. And I was just like, what is going on? So then I found out why I was getting all these messages. It got picked up by the local news there, like half a year later somehow. And then that went viral and then it got picked up by other local news in Morocco. And then finally it got picked up by the Huffington Post of that region, the Maghreb region in that part of Africa. And when that got picked up, uh, that's really where I got all the messages from and the follows. And I decided to, it was in Arabic of course, so I decided to translate it. And then I realized why I got all these messages extreme on both sides. They completely sensationalized what I wrote, exaggerated, even changed them, some of the things I said and made it sound way more crazy than it was. So after that, the experience kind of left a bad taste in my mouth and I was really focused on the project then. And when it came to the blog, I just wanted to give out helpful information and things like that. So I decided not to tell any stories and not deal with that and just focus on the project. So. That's why I really haven't told any stories, but again, it's what people always ask. So I'm gonna tell stories now. I'll probably share more in the future if people wanna hear more. So let's get into this one that just happened. I'm in Minsk, Belarus. Uh, to give a little context, without getting too political, Lukashenko is the president here. He's been the president, I think, since the Soviet days, so for like almost 30 years. He always wins the election. Some people think that he fixes the election, but since the last election in August, the woman that ran against him, she left, I think, to Lithuania. Don't, don't quote me on that, but she left the country and all her supporters and more people, they, they think it was fixed. So there's been protests every week since August, and usually they're on Sunday. Now, when I got here, I thought, uh, why not check out one of the protests? But when I read about it online, I found out that protests here are not really legal and they're squashed very quickly actually so quickly that most of them now have been more in the neighborhoods outside of the center. Still, I wanted to check it out and uh, you know me, I try to, to feel things out and do as much as I can, test the waters. So if there's protests here, it's something happening. It's partly why I've gotten arrested before because I do kind of push things. So I decided to try to find uh, one of the protests on this last Sunday, but 
I couldn't really find much information online. I found that they were going to a courtyard because someone was killed there uh, in a neighborhood here and they called it Square of Changes. So I actually went there on the Sunday, but nothing, I didn't see anything. So then the next day was a Monday and I had a ton of work and I decided since it's Monday, there's not a lot of activity on Monday. I'm not gonna do any photography. I'm just gonna focus on computer work, but I did need to get a SIM card I had to wait till I got my registration here in Belarus, and then I kind of procrastinated. So I needed to go get, get a SIM card, so I decided to take a break. Found a local uh, MTC is the, the biggest provider here. The shop was right across from Independent Square here, which is one of the main squares. To me, it's probably visually the most appealing. They have a nice church there. They have a Lenin statue. Right now, they have a big Christmas tree. So usually it's quiet out there though. It's not too busy, just some people around the Christmas tree. But when I was walking to the MTC shop, and of course I still had my camera, I saw a big crowd around the tree. And there was no signs, there was no protest signs yet. There was one Belarus flag, but still I knew it probably had something to do with the protests. Maybe they were just for me. So I decided why not to try to see what I can do and take some photos if anything happens. Now when I walk over there, I see this older woman I don't think she has anything to do with the protest, but she's got a picture of Jesus and then a cross in her hand, and she's got some interesting clothes on. And so I take a few pictures of her with the crowd behind, but nothing too interesting because it's just a crowd of people surrounding the tree. So I'm taking a few pictures of her, then she walks over just above the tunnel that goes underneath the square, and I notice below there's a few police and they're not allowing anyone through the tunnel. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe something's gonna happen soon here. Still, no one's really doing anything at the protest. So I continue to take a few pictures of this woman and some other things around there. As I'm photographing this woman, I notice off in the distance, there's these rows and rows of police, marching police coming, and they're all in black from head to toe. They even have their faces covered in black, just with little slits for the eyes. And they look like they have some type of armor on too. It's just not the normal police uniforms. And there has to be some like minimum requirements to be on the police squad or at least that division because these guys are big dudes. And they're just rows of them marching. And I'm like, wow, okay. And then I turn and I see the same thing on the other corner, rows of marching police. Then I turn around, rows coming down, rows coming down on all corners and they're surrounding that little part of the square around the Christmas tree. So obviously something's about to go down. I probably shouldn't be in the middle of this, but I do take a few more pictures. Um, one thing was there was an older woman, she comes with her hands like this up to the police, uh, like arrest me, obviously. So I take a couple pictures of that. I do notice that there's people off in the distance filming it with their, their phone cameras too. But again, I'm just filling it out. I know police previously had seen me already take photos. They hadn't said anything. So I'm still, I'm like, I better get out because they're about to, to start doing something. And so there's a little opening. I get out. I walk up to the church where some other people are, turn around, and then I notice a policeman walking towards me. So I'm like, here we go. So he comes up to me, no English at all, just stoic, and he asks for my ID. So I give him my passport. So as he's going through my passport, he starts talking to me in Russian. I tell him I don't speak Russian, I only speak English. He doesn't seem to care as he keeps talking in Russian. He actually, for some reason, even, even asks me if I am Russian. He goes Russian and points at me, which was kind of weird since I gave him a, a US passport. But I said no, and then he starts pointing at all the stamps and uh, the, in the passport. And obviously I have a lot of passport stamps and he didn't seem to like that. Or, it wasn't so much that he didn't like it, but it, it caused some suspicion. So he, he didn't like the ones, especially like in Ukraine. He kept pointing to Ukraine, and I have a lot of Ukraine stamps because I've done a lot of work there in the past. And then he's like, follow me. He didn't say follow me, but he signaled it. And so we're walking, and we walk through the police, and he talks to another policeman, and that policeman looks at my passport, and then he takes me down, and there's a van there, a big van, and he opens it up, and he tells me to get in. And I don't really ever do that. I don't get into small spaces if I can stop it from happening. It's happened a few times. Uh, other times I was arrested, I was able to talk my way out of not getting into a car. There was some security in, in Ghana where they tried to put me in a room and we, I was able to argue at my way out of that. So at first I was like, no, I'm not getting in the, in the van. I don't, tell me what's going on. He didn't care at all. So he kept pointing in the van. He didn't get physical with me at all. So we're kind of like going back and forth a little bit, even though we don't speak each other's language. Finally, someone else comes over and I have them, they tell me that, that he's just gonna take me to the police station. 
and I really didn't have a lot of choice. He saw my passport, and I got an okay vibe. It just felt like they were just straight by the book, and any suspicion they have, they have complete control in, in this country, so they do what they want. So I get in the van, he sits by me, and then he uh, starts going through my passport again, and now he's pointing at every single stamp. He goes through the whole book and asking me what, basically why I went there. And I tell him, tourism, tourism, tourism. And he keeps repeating, like, tourism, tourism. So we're going through that. And then he asks to see my phone. So I show him my phone. And he goes through, like, every messenger on my phone, like my, my uh, text messages, my WhatsApp, my Facebook. And he scrolls through it, which is kind of weird. That's never happened to me before with police. But maybe he's thinking I'm a spy. I don't know. And then he has to see, finally, he has to see my photos on the camera, which I thought he would have done that at the start. So he looks at the photos. He doesn't really seem to care about the photos at all. It just feels like he's just going by the book. And he doesn't, when I try to talk to him and ask him what's going on, he just ignores me anyway. So we get to the station. I get in the station. He takes me up the, the stairs and we go into a, what looks like a courtroom. And he tells me to sit down. Now a woman officer comes over and she takes all the information from my passport and she walks off. And then he walks off with my passport. Then he comes back with another guy who also fills out forms with my information and then has me stand up and like takes like, you know, just basic like mug shots, but not in front of a wall, but he has me do different profiles and he takes my mug shots with his phone. Then they give me my passport back. So then I'm waiting there and then more and more people are being arrested and, and brought in, all locals. And it's just really weird situation because I don't know what's going on. Am I actually in a courtroom for a reason or is this just a, a way to hold people for now? And then I hear one guy officer come in and I hear a little bit like he might speak English. And so I ask him if he speaks English and he says yes. And so I ask him, can you just tell me what's going on, why I'm being arrested? You know, I'm playing like like the dumb tourist, like I don't know anything what's going on. And uh, he he ignores me at first and then he turns and he goes, wait, and then he walks off. So I'm like, okay. And another guy comes in and he has to see my phone again. And he does the same thing. He goes through all the messengers. Then he has to see my camera and he goes through some of the pictures, but he again doesn't seem to care that much. So then he leaves and I try to ask him again and the same thing. They don't, no one really cares that I don't know what's going on. He just says, wait. So then more and more people come in. Finally, it's, it's a packed courtroom. I've been in there for like at least an hour waiting. Uh, multiple people have come, checked my information. So as these people come in, they're all locals. I'm definitely the only foreigner in there. And I noticed that some of them obviously know each other. It almost made me feel a little bit better because no one seemed like really scared in there. And it was almost like they knew that this was probably gonna happen. If you protest here, you're gonna get arrested. Probably most of them have been arrested before. They're doing the same thing with all them, taking their information, taking photos of them. Uh, one woman actually had like a protest sign. When he took the photo of her, he had her open the sign. Yeah, so I'm just watching everything that's happening, um, trying to find some information. I ask another person there, no one speaks any English, but when I mentioned that I'm a tourist, he talks to some other people and they all just laughed that I'm a tourist. It was just a, it was a really weird situation. Then finally, I got a man comes in and he asked me to come with him. We go down a hall into his office. He's obviously higher up. He has me sit down and he starts off with a little bit of English, which was good. And he actually starts off by apologizing, saying that they just had to check me out because I had a lot of passport stamps and they didn't know what I was doing at the square, which I was like, well, it's a square. Like, why wouldn't I be there? But I, again, I'm playing like I don't know anything about a protest or anything like that. So. He apologizes, we're talking a little bit, and then he's like, you're gonna need to delete all the photos on your camera. So uh, I don't like doing that, obviously. Um, but I'm able to talk with him a little bit. He's, everyone else has been like completely indifferent. He was the only one that seemed like he was willing to talk to me a little bit. So we're talking and I'm asking uh, why he has a problem with the photos of the woman in there, like why she's not part of the protest. He's like, just delete it. He actually tells me that protests are illegal there, so it's illegal to take photos of them. I don't know if that's true, kind of weird, but that's what he tells me. So he has me going through the photos. There's a couple photos in there I really don't want to delete. So as we're going through them, I'm able to talk my way into only deleting the ones that, that I didn't care about. So I did keep the ones 
that were okay. Still looking back, none of them were, were that great, but at least I have something from it. And after I did that, he takes one picture of my passport, one more picture of me, and then I get escorted out and I'm out. So overall, I think it was around two to three hours. When I get out, I don't even know where I'm at and I don't have my SIM card yet, obviously. So I had to find my way back, but it ended up only being like a couple kilometers from the square. So it wasn't so bad, but they obviously didn't care. They just kicked me out. But I was happy to be out, happy not to be in jail. When I've told locals about this, the first thing they always ask is, how long was I in jail and did they beat me up? When it comes to my whole experience with the police and everyone I dealt with, none of them were physically abusive. I didn't see any physical assault. They weren't friendly at all either. It just felt like, just almost like robotic. They were doing their job and doing it by the book and they didn't care at all about you, but they also didn't instigate anything. It, it was very like indifferent and robotic. Like I said before, I mean, there was multiple times where I'm just trying, can you just help me like understand what's going on? They didn't care at all. They didn't care at all that I didn't speak Russian. It was just like completely robotic. But when they brought people in, I didn't see them push them around. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I'm just honest and I didn't see anything bad. Just very indifferent, very robotic and very by the book. The actual experience, the worst part about it was really just not knowing what's going on at all. I don't know too much about, you hear stories, what could happen. I didn't know, and, and that's the thing about these stories. I've been arrested before, and it's been much worse than this one. I've had a lot of dangerous situations, knives pulled on me, like being chased by gangsters, th different things where it was pretty crazy. And people always ask me, like, how scared were you? And the truth is, I'm not trying to sound like I'm bad or anything, but I don't really get scared in those situations, but I'm really kind of just on adrenaline and focus when these things happen, not just with police, but any dangerous situation. When I did this project, or when I photographed cities, I always decided I'm gonna take full on risk because I think you either take no risk or you take all the risk. Anything in the middle is when bad things happen. So you have to be confident. So I'm always confident and I'm focused on getting out of the situation. So in these situations, I'm just thinking of all the possibilities of what's happening, all the possibilities of what I can do to get out of the situation. I'm reading body language like crazy, getting a feel like with the first police officer, he wasn't nice at all, but I didn't get a bad vibe like he was gonna, when I got inside the van, he was gonna take all my money or do something to me, you know, which can happen in a lot of countries. So I did kind of trust my vibe with him. I, I, I go off vibe and body language and then I try to talk my way or work my way out of it if I need to. And I'm just focused on it and I don't have time to worry too much. Now, when I was in the courtroom there for over an hour, uh, just waiting, I had a little time to worry, but still, I, I try to stay positive because being scared is the worst thing you can do pretty much in any situation. In dangerous situations, it's bad because people see the scared body language and they take advantage of that when it comes to police. If you're scared, usually that makes them more suspicious, so you don't want that. You just have to just weigh your possibilities and, and just get through it, and that's what I do. So that's what happened, that's the story. I'm not gonna actually share this on, online here until I'm out of Minsk, probably just safe. I didn't say anything that bad, but maybe they won't like that I do, did keep a, a few of the photos. But that's what happened to me. I think I'm going to share more of my stories later. Not all now, but over time, I'll share some more of the stories, uh, especially if people want to hear them. But that's my story. Arrested in Minsk, Belarus for photography. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week. Cheers.